Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you so much for inviting me to make these closing remarks. Um, I was delighted when, I've got, when I got the invitation. I've been even more delighted throughout the day hearing about the work of CREATE. And I suppose more generally, it's just been a privilege to spend time on a day like today with people who make level-headed contributions to the public sphere, their job. Um, it's, I couldn't have thought, thought of better people to spend the day with. Um, Nearly 10 years ago, I interviewed Andrew Gowers on the day that he uh, released the Gowers Review of Intellectual Property. Um, I was ushered through various uh, corridors in the labyrinthine treasury department, and I spent nearly an hour with him uh, talking about his experience crafting the review. That interview is now a piece of history and is still available online. Um, I was still working at Open Democracy then, although I'd already been uh, given and uh, accepted the job of executive director at the Open Rights Group. And of course, you met there, some of you may have met at least uh, the present executive director, uh, Jim Killick, when he spoke about the role of intermediaries. Um, and I was due to start that post in the new year. So, so what Andrew Garris told me was that on the one hand, IP was a priesthood, and on the other hand, uh, a lobbyist's playground. Um, he said that it was a priesthood um, in the sense, and I'm quoting him now, <laughs> um, that it's studied and enacted by these quite funny men of a certain age in legal chambers, dusty files all around them and so forth. Uh, and then that it was a lobbyist playground in the sense uh, that the people who are the IP holders, uh, the people who always say more IP protection is always good, they're well organized, they're well focused, they're articulate and they're well financed, whereas the people who pay for it, the consumers are very diffuse. Um, and he said so up until now it's been a one way argument. So regarding the dusty men in suits, uh, I think what I've witnessed today is at least a slightly different picture. I think thanks to CREATE and the driving forces behind it, the tools and resources now available uh, to policymakers considering IP reform on a more evidential basis, um, they are dramatically enhanced. Amoeba, copyright evidence, the litigation database, the extensive literature review on human rights and copyright, and the research on intermediaries and, and takedown policies have all really, really enriched that space for policymakers should they choose to pay attention to it. Um, back when I was campaigning against copyright term extension in sound recordings at the EU level in 2008, there was a distinct sense that we were on the outside of an industry looking in. Our most po pos um, powerful quantitative campaign message, what you might call our 350 million euros, um, came in fact, was it pounds? Um, came in fact, or is it even real? Who knows? It came from that. It was, it was something like 59 cents. That was our quantitative message. Uh, performers, 80% of performers would gain 59 cents a year from the term extension, uh, which was being put forward by the Commission as a pension fund for, for, for poor performers. So that was our most quanti powerful quantitative fact. And it came, in fact, from analysis of material that had been commissioned by industry. So really, in terms of what we had to work with as advocates, the picture uh, was quite poor. And now I can see that that debate could have played out differently. Um, create by ent entering into meaningful partnerships across the creative industries. Um, the evidence they're able to produce is robust and it's relevant. And it's relevant both for those currently benefiting from the IP regime as well as those who'd like to see it reformed. I think Create have pegged out their tent very wide, and I think that's great. Through that, they've shown that creators and consumers of IP, they come in all shapes and sizes, and that the current law as a one-size-fits-all solution can chafe in some awkward places. Um, crucially, I think they've taken a highly data-literate and open approach, and I think what that means is that the research so far produced and the data collecting efforts so far initiated by CREATE will be used again and again by all the stakeholders in IP reform and policy makers for the creative ind industries. I liked it when Martin said this morning that anyone who now enters the field of research will be captured by one of our data projects. I think in other in, in, in my other guise as a privacy campaigner, I found that quite eerie, but I think in this setting it was very, it was, um, 
um, it was very apposite and very useful. Martin also mentioned in that speech that evidence-based policy is still an ambition, and I think that's a view that I've heard uh, echoed throughout the day, that actually rent-seeking is still the order of the day in terms of policy making. But I do be believe that we need this kind of sustained and nuanced work in the field, because in the absence of evidence, in the abstract, intellectual property is simply too hot a topic. I've often marvelled at how one thing can sim simultaneously be a labourite for the most cherished members of our society, the holy artist, um, the holy figure of the struggling artist, but at the same time function as the handmaiden of the kind of global uh, corporate globalisation that gets people out on the streets in you know, the cities where the World Trade Organisation hold talks. It is the inconvenient truth of IP that it is both of these things simultaneously. And I wonder if perhaps we need a new slogan, it's not IP that kills kittens, it's policymakers around IP that kill kittens. Um, that might uh, focus a few minds. So I'm hoping that the uh, dateline on this legacy brochure is not an RIP, but actually that we'll see this kind of work continue into the future, whatever the shape and whatever, whatever kinds of politicians we may engage in and engage with then. So, I think Create's provided a template for work to support evidence-based policy making and it looks through the volume of activity that Create has undertaken in the years of its existence, like providing that template was a full-time job. It's, I'm just really impressed by the breadth of the work that has come under the Create banner. Um, we continue to live in times of technological change and these arguments aren't going to go away. And I think we know that each time such change threatens an incumbent business model or an information market, intellectual property will be called into service both to protect that incumbent market and the cause of intellectual property reform may be co-opted by the challenges to that incumbent market, so as if you wish the new information giants. Um, John Kay talked about the risk that rent seeking, the continued rent seeking of incumbent IP holders poses to our economy. He talked about our economy going into a kind of sclerosis. And actually I wonder if when that happens, you know, the public will understand why that was. You know, it's the mood in the room, you know, has been depressed for a number of reasons, but I also feel like there's a sense that we're still not getting through to the policy makers that we need to get through to with the message of, um, of IP reform. Um, other aspects in the last 10 years of my work in digital rights have, have accelerated rather more quickly, and I wonder when intellectual property reform is going to have its Snowden moment. And I don't mean, you know, some whistleblower from DG Internal Markt is going to, you know, release a whole load of documents online. What I mean by a Snowden moment is when an issue that's been of concern to a particular community for some time finds itself overnight on the public stage. It could happen in a number of ways. Um, uh, one of the uh, participants in an earlier panel talked about the implied consent time bomb that's ticking on a lot of the intermediaries working in the creative economy. So it could be something like that that we could predict. Um, it could be something completely out of the blue. When I was working at the Open Rights Group and the only time we made it into the Sun newspaper was when the BBC issued a takedown notice to a woman who had put knitting patterns of Doctor Who characters online. And suddenly we were in the national news. That's not the kind of thing that, I mean, maybe in this country, you know, spurs immediate reform, but it was, a, you know, you don't know when these public moments come and the key is to be prepared. I thought Julia Rader spoke very well, not just about the incremental reforms that could happen to copyright policy, but also what we could look to in terms of a more, a broader reform, in terms of sketching out what we want from copyright at an international level, some really practical suggestions for new global copyright treaties that this community could be putting forward. If there's a lesson to learn from the electronic privacy community um, and the Snowden moment that they had is that you must be prepared 
with a vision for a better future for when that moment comes, because there's someone who's got a vision for a worse future and it's in their top drawer. Um, the future I'm most worried about, well, actually I wasn't until this morning, and I don't mean the referendum, just, you know, these conferences get you thinking and that's what's wonderful, you know, all the ideas buzzing around, often you get a few new ones rubbed off on you. But, you know, what happens if the information incumbents of today, the people that we accuse of this rent-seeking behaviour um, are with policy makers. What if the information giants of today, the intermediaries, the Facebooks, the Googles, what if they suddenly started behaving like the information incumbents? What if they started seeing ways that they could use copyright law for rent-seeking with their vast information empires? Um, but anyway, we're depressed enough already, so let's not think about that for too much longer. Um, so anyway, I hope that CREATE is able to continue its work. It's certainly something I know people in the reform community and all communities find valuable. Um, and what's, what's important, I think, and I, what I'd like to close with is the importance of contextualising the role of intellectual property on the ground for the people that this economy and also this society needs, which, by which I mean the innovators in the arts and the sciences, the educators, and, uh, and those who preserve our past so we might learn from it. And thank you very much. That's all I had to say. Thank you.